As every flower fades, and as all youth departs, so life at every stage, so every virtue, so our grasp of truth, blooms in its day and may not last forever. Since life may summon us at every age, be ready, heart, for parting, new endeavor. Be ready bravely and without remorse to find new light that old ties cannot give. In all beginnings dwells a magic force for guarding us and helping us to live. Hey, this is Nick. Hey, this is Nathan. And this is David. And welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. On this episode, we're looking at Herman Hesse's The Glass Bead Game. So, Nick, if you could, for our readers, just try to give them a summary of what you think this book is about. (laughs) All right. uh, Trying to do a summary for this massive intellectual behemoth of a book uh, is an uphill battle. But to start, uh, we could say that it's a fictionalized biography of Joseph Connect, who is the Magister Ludi of the Glass Beat Game itself. And the Glass Beat Game is sort of this highest echelon of intellectual achievement within the province of Castalia, which was sort of created to preserve scholarship and intellect um, within this uh, future world that Hesse has created. So basically what we have is is sort of Hesse's attempt at a science fiction novel. So Nathan, uh, you know, to start, is is this of substance? You know, I don't think I've ever gotten so far into a book before I decided whether I was wasting my time or not. I think I was probably 400 pages in before I thought, I'm glad that I've gotten this far in and I can't wait to finish this book. So um, my answer ultimately is yes. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you, actually, Nathan. It It is a book of some substance if you have patience and the diligence to kind of persevere, because it is a slow start, and I think... Slow burn. Yes, it's a slow burn. The text, because of the way it's... Because of who the narrator is, I think, as well, it is, it is a book yeah. about intellect, of intellect, and written with intellect there's hardly any emotion so it it takes a while for us to really get into it yeah i i totally agree this is a royal pain in the ass but when i finished it i've been thinking about it constantly and so i think uh i think it's actually probably my favorite hessa and we wow. can you know sort of wow. we can get into rankings later we can do that yeah uh it's not it wasn't my favorite as i was reading it it's just like this thing is just grading me in so many different ways but it is massively substantial I want to ask, so um, I don't know where exactly, actually, I do know exactly, three, page 317 is where it finally <laughs> broke through for me. So at page 300 for each of you, were you sure that you had made the right decision in opening this book? Remind me where that is. So that's uh, shortly before he writes the circular letter, which for me was when it started to like get into something tangible. Okay. And, and you, you hear his voice at length for the first time, but just... I, I you know the first I don't know about you guys but I I attempted to read this book before and I gave up around page 200 and when I got to page 200 this time I was like I'm never going to finish this book I should just <laughs> quit book club quit the podcast I can't do this this is not worth reading this is some sick joke that Hess is playing on fanboys like me Yeah Herman Hess is weeding you out you would not have made it in Castalia That's right Yeah <laughs> This was my third attempt and the first two, I didn't make it past, I think, about 100 pages. And this time, I I kind of moved through those quickly. I tried to move through those that first chunk in, like, one day just so I could get it out of the way. And by the time that Joseph makes it to the uh, the Brotherhood, I can't remember the name of the, the, the sanctuary, and he starts interacting with uh, Father Jacobus. That is when I was like, okay, now I'm really getting somewhere with this book. I, I started connecting with him as a character. I started connecting with the ideas a lot more because I think in Father Jacobus, I saw myself, right? I saw someone questioning how ridiculous this world was and how absurd this glass bead game seemed, even though it's never really understood exactly how it's played. But you get the idea that it is purely a game of intellect and nothing more. Yeah, I think uh, I was actually totally hooked in the introduction. It's one of my favorite pieces of the novel. Really, and then and then I got lost 
for a while. Um, but then, like, you know, the amount of foreshadowing stuff is they drop in these little hints. I, like, it seemed like it was a little bit of espionage as they're sending Connect out on missions. Uh, it hints at, you know, the whole, like, two poles thing of of having to deal with, with the absolutes and... And uh, you see that his downfall or, or demise or whatever, however we want to categorize it, is coming and it is forming and it's on its way. So I found it to be amazingly tedious at points. Yes. But uh, I, think I, was, I think I was pretty well hooked just because, I don't know, I committed to it. Okay. I attempted to read this once and I read it once. So Oh, I, I guess, guess you, you win this episode. I then. guess I just won the glass bead game. <laughs> I think that's it. But yeah, so why, why don't we back up and actually actually try to give a little bit more structure around like what what this thing is i mean so the glass bead game you you hinted at it perfectly it's it's never really fully explained what it is in the novel sort of attempts it's it's references it's supposed to use similar means of communication to unify music and actually, philosophy and maybe we should all just take a take a stab at describing what we think the glass bead game is oh i like that like tangibly yeah okay. you should start Okay, the way that I interpreted it is that um, in all of philosophy, in music, in mathematics, in every form of human thought, there's, there are patterns, there are rhythms, there are archetypes that repeat themselves. And the glass bead game is stripping away all the context around those patterns and turning those patterns themselves into um, a language. So those patterns become... Uh, are attached to symbols which are then on these glass beads and you arrange these glass beads to tell alternative um not histories exactly but to to move through all time and cultures within sort of a connect the dots sort of structure yeah right and that's sort of why one of his his being connect uh one of his big scholarly challenges that he gave himself was reverse translating everything back into its own language. It was taking a glass bead game itself that had been unified and then moving everything back into its own domain. And so I, I, I totally follow you there. The thing that I can't grasp is what it looks like when it's being played or how it's being played. And so my interpretation of this is, uh, you know, they had one glass bead game where people did write-ins and so uh, he ended up winning Joseph Connect. And so it sounds like you architect an entire game of relationships already. And so that when people play it together, it's actually just sort of one person laying it out for everyone and then everyone appreciating it for both its scholarly and its meditative qualities. And so I actually just picture the glass bead game as this massive sort of transcendental ceremony where like nobody's moving and they're all just like on like an intellectual, just plane. Nobody's actually competing. They're just like appreciating these relationships. <laughs> Do you, I, I imagine that, I imagine there, it like being a massive sort of Chinese checkers board, but you know, a hundred feet across and with, yeah. covered with colorful glass beads and everybody's kind of standing around it in robes. Right. Obviously, people are wearing robes. I mean, that was... Yeah, you know, yeah. the preferred clothing of free thought. <laughs> and I imagine a sort of multidimensional abacus where all these strings and various beads that people slide across to, to show a certain measurement or a certain connection. Like, I imagine the, the game itself was played on, like, a court, but this court is full of all of these wires, and all of these wires have various beads on them. Do you think that hessa had in mind a specific vision about what it looked like because he doesn't really describe it no because at, at first i was imagining when i first started reading i imagined it was more of a game about making connections and illusions so like early on when i was reading i, was, I imagined like okay someone says to i say to nathan like let's say i say to nathan i list all of these chemical elements in a certain pattern and you hear this set of patterns of chemical elements, and you go, oh, that's, that's a Bach fugue because of how I organized the list of chemical elements. And somehow each element was connected to a note on a piano. And then from that Bach fugue, you went and did something else, and we went back and forth making these insane connections to things. 
it is that too, isn't it? Yeah. But the thing that I struggle with, so the final glass bead game that they architect is based on, I think, like Chinese architecture of the house. Yeah. Do you remember? Like they started with like floor plans to homes. Yeah. Right. So I'm just trying to like place that within, you know, we have certain art forms, right? There's, there's writing, there's, there's music, there's, there's visual art, right? Um, but I think there's an extra layer of how everything can be unified and the scholarly content of it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's sort of some of the brilliance of Hesse is it's, it's easy to say like, okay, what if there's a pattern that, that turns into this Iron Maiden riff, right? Because everything's sort of like numerically based and there's options and there's limitations and a number of elements and a number of notes in a scale and stuff like that. But I think what Hesse didn't explain and he didn't explain on purpose is what about all this other stuff that seems like so unbelievable to try to normalize into some sort of set of pattern and things. I think that's what he leaves to the reader and he purposely doesn't fill in. It's just this thought experiment and it's, I don't know, to me it's, it's, it's so out there that if you try to like box it in, you immediately realize you don't have the language to describe this type of thing, which is what he's talking about in the first place. Yeah. Cause now I'm trying to imagine the construction of a Chinese home based on an Iron Maiden riff. <laughs> and my mind is wandering into strange places and i imagine that's part of the game maybe probably has six floors and it has six windows and it's <laughs> some numbers of the beast in there yeah um so what what is this book actually about oh yeah <laughs> so my my interpretation of it is that Basically, it's a cautionary tale against receding so far into intellectualism and scholarship that you lose the context of history. And it's basically, uh, you know, you have two split worlds. You have you have Castalia, which represents um, basically no nothing new, only only study, only references, and then you have the rest of the world, which is. Um, you know, it's the working man. It's a little bit crass. It has its political problems and greed and all that. And both sides can't identify with each other. And one of the major relationships that I really appreciated in the novel was between, uh, connect and, uh, where we got Pl- Plinio, 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 Plinio. We'll go with Plinio. Um, super good at pronunciations if you haven't noticed. Um, and so, so Plinio is the guy that, uh, was from the outside world who studied within Castalia because his, his parents were so rich. And then basically he left and pursued a, a regular job. And as they meet later in life, they both kind of realize they're, they're a little bit unhappy for their own reasons. And so the, I think the lesson that I've pulled out of this the most outside some of the spiritual and transcendental elements is really just the coming together of intellectualism and society that they both need to exist within each other's context. Otherwise it just gets so fragmented that it doesn't work. And I don't think it's, I I agree with everything you've said. And I want to add that it's not only that both need to coexist, but both need to coexist so that you can move into a spiritual world or a spiritual connection. And maybe that comes out more in connects own writing, which is the posthumous writings at the end of the book. And part of it maybe is just being familiar with Hesse as well. But I, I definitely saw that in the three lives, in the poetry, and in Connect's death. That there was some there was something greater than just the real world and the intellectual world coexisting. It was coexisting for a higher purpose. I agree with that ultimately in the in the initial text and in the sort of biography of Joseph Connect, I think that that was maybe deliberately left out or obfuscated. Um, but I think to me, there's, I, I, I keep revolving around the story in different ways because there's so many different ways to interpret it. Not, I mean, there's the historical perspective, which hit me hard at the first when Castalia seemed like such an escapist from the rise of the third Reich. And in connects letter, he actually, paraphrases a, a, a quote from from Goring who is you know I don't one of Hitler's generals and it's like it's a sp- specific criticism of what was happening at, at his time and I think an attempt at utopia 
and then his criticism of that utopia and basically the far ends of of humans uh attempts at, at achievement are are as empty as each other or as flawed as each other um then there's the the characters themselves um and, and what they do is it is it about the characters and then there's the the format that he chose to write it in which was the voice of these anonymous biographers who are trying to attempt this objective description of this important figure's life there's the poetry of joseph connect there's the legend of joseph connect which is kind of like the pop culture version of his life and then there's his posthumous or his writings that were published posthumously which were him imagining connect imagining himself in various times and places as various times and people um and i can't help but believe that that there's a narrative happening at that level too within like what does it mean to try to interpret a story objectively versus subjectively versus from the person's own mind versus from the person's attempt to fictionalize their own life and that's i think that's the importance of having all of those things together and i think that's also important in having those posthumous writings come at the end because if they were to come where they occurred in joseph's life it would have disrupted that sort of bizarre objective view of the the what do you call him a castilian uh who's who's writing the biography and i i think that it it, it interprets in a way the rest of the the book because i can't help but read it in in a, some way i mean you can look at it that you know obviously the his um the lives that he wrote those last three stories were written as a student as a young man and then he dies much later on but because as a reader we read those happening after his death i can't help but read it as his reincarnation as him attempting again and attempting again and attempting again and then the fact that the final story actually leads leaves him um you know embracing his fate um meditating and practicing yoga and that that the last story he actually doesn't die in the other stories he dies or is approaching death so i i i disagree with that i think i think those contextualize his life better than they are as seen as some sort of future reincarnation i think the life that he lived and the way that he died in the biography was actually more important than the yogi at the end because the yogi at the end doesn't pass anything on there's no there's no teacher pupil relationship there it's it's purely it's the exact opposite of castalia it's 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 all meditation it's all yeah. inward I, or I, maybe I think it's that's related the point you think that's I, the point because okay. the whole yeah because i mean the whole book is i mean he hammers this like master apprentice idea everything is a master apprentice everything is hierarchical um and at the end when he um when dasa who is connect meets the yogi who is in a state of pure what enlightenment sure. I, don't, I don't know he's pure beyond this world bliss pure being um he cannot be an apprentice to that being he can only he can only practice and there's there's a um there's a quote let me see if I can pull it up where he says, I think it's, it's in, it's in that last, in that last life. Um, he says, this is um, Dasa's voice altogether obeying and serving were better and far easier, seemlier, seemlier and far more harmless than commanding and taking responsibility. Um, and I think that that looking to the, looking to the master, looking to the way to do things to um, achieve being or perfection is what ultimately fades away. Yeah, it's the way to being in charge. And maybe we should talk about this. So the three lives themselves. So the first life is basically uh, a tribal rainmaker who ultimately has to sacrifice himself for the good of the tribe um, and for the good of the seasons. Uh, second one is, I believe, the title's Father Confessor. Yeah. And so this is uh, two individual confessors who basically seek each other out because they have reached such a uh, difficult end point in their lives that they think that 
that what they have been doing has not been meaningful enough. So they want us to find the other one such that they can confess to them. They sort of end up confessing to each other and kind of forming this, this symbiotic uh, master apprentice relationship. And the final one being, being Dasa, um, which I, I love how Hess is so direct about this stuff, but Dasa, I looked it up as like Sanskrit for, for servant, just yeah. like connect I, is German for servant. I figured it was. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't look it up. He's just like, like, this is what it is. You should pay attention. I'm going to give you a symbol right now. Well, it's uh, also so, Joseph's own writing and it's writing his imagination of himself. So each one is named Joseph or connect or Dasa. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so in the final, Dasa, who's, I believe it's like, it's actually an avatar too, right? It's not actually, he, he gives it an extra layer at the beginning of the story. But essentially, this um, this man uh, meets a yogi, and the yogi gives him a spiritual journey in the form of, is it pronounced Maya? Mm -hmm. In the form of Maya, um, that takes him through a life of, of obtaining riches and power and all of the responsibility uh, that comes with it. And it's, it's basically a, uh, a life of despair. And, um, as he takes him through that journey at the end, Dasa realizes that, um, you know, the enlightenment and, and the bliss would have only come through, um, the meditation of the yogi himself. So you basically have these three individual, like Nathan said, master apprenticeship relationships that are written by Joseph connect, but the historical context I want to throw on this is that Hesse started out writing a book that was based on parallel lives. So he effectively wrote and released in some form those lives first before the glass bead game. And he started a and fourth. The story, correct, he started a fourth. And the fourth was what the life of Joseph Connect in the glass bead game was supposed to be. And this is where I think the historical context is so in important, is that as he was doing it in the time of World War II, it just sort of blew everything up. And so these parallel lives actually turned into one massive biography and sort of I view as a cautionary tale against a bunch of things, where then the posthumous writings at the end were then exactly that. They weren't the parallel lives, but they were turned into the works written by Joseph Connect himself. And so like, what does that mean? Nobody knows. That's why it's, it's, a pause. it's too big. Of, it's too big of an idea. We don't fucking know. Um, That's really interesting because reading it, I I kind of had that impression. Like it, the obtuseness of the first section of the, of the biography of Joseph Connect and like why why put us through this? You know, conceptually, it's interesting that it's boring and dry because it's written from a time when people are disconnected from the more passionate aspects of humanity. But I got that concept. Let's move on to something interesting. Why dwell on that for so long? And to me, it kind of seemed like it seemed like he was. The story was stuck in this recursive state where it was like, well, at least focusing so intently on this, this intellectual achievement of this future world is better than. As a way of escaping what's going on right now in the world. Yeah, I think uh, so. The tone of it. My theory is that uh, this is Hesse sort of making fun of just how dry all of this like intellectual, historical, biographical scholarship is. And you mentioned like being trolled by Hesse as a Hesse fanboy and not being able to finish this book. <laughs> like that's that's part of I think I think it's this big unfunny joke by Hesse. Yes. And it's it is it in is. my opinion pretty unfunny. Although sometimes I do think it is a, a tiny bit funny, but. Uh, I think he's basically created this farcical biography that's by, written by somebody who I assume is just like a minor Castalian. And uh, it's just so impossible to get through. And he keeps like he keeps like breaking the fourth wall in a lot of ways of being like, well, you know, we have to stick to this because it's a biography and it's all we know. And we have to stick to it in this style because in Castalia, there's no, there's no individualism. So this is all we know. And then eventually the final piece becomes legend and that's where it actually becomes interesting. And, and the writing starts to flourish and there's, it's just, it's, it's so much more poetic and so much more beautiful, but it's also, he admits fiction. And so it goes back to history's third dimension is fiction. Yeah. 
And so he's sort of making fun of yeah. people trying to distill history down to the absence of individualism and the absence of fiction when it's always fiction. And I think, I think the ultimate question that it poses is what is truth? Is truth something that can be objectively understood or is truth something that is only a subjective experience? And I think the conclusion of the book is that it's only an, a subjective experience. Like it cannot be passed on objectively. If we look at the life of Joseph Connect objectively, um, mostly we won't look at it. And it's not until we get into the mind of, of the human being and apply our own, you know, our own internal struggles and subjective realities that we can start to get closer to a ultimate truth. An ultimate truth. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I, <laughs> do you guys not take Hesse as serious as I do? Cause I think he's all about ultimate truth. I think Hesse is fucking with us at, at a little bit of a level. You are going to need to explain what ultimate truth is. Yeah. I mean, ultimate truth is Maya that, that all of this is illusion, but it's not though. Yeah, I, I even think that like he finds fallacy in that message himself. And that's kind of what the novel is about is that, you know, I mean, he, he wrote Siddhartha, right? And, and like previous books are sort of an intellectual hero or a spiritual hero waging war against whatever it is, right? And in the end, um, oftentimes they succeed or they, they, they find the way towards, you know, their respective ultimate truths. But I think this is him at the end of his career, writing this massive thing as he sees society crumbling around him, just being like, there is nobody's, nobody's going to make it there. There is no ultimate truth. There's all of these, uh, historical contexts that will be applied to that truth. And I think that's what he's trying to lay out is just, you know, there is no, there is no perfect end. And he's doing it in this massively complicated, esoteric, philosophical fictionalized biography with posthumous poetry and and additional writings that he previously released and and linking it together in the form of a of a game that we can't actually picture because it looks nothing like basketball and uh it's it's i i love it i it was a fucking thorn in my side to read but um it just fills me with like the most ideas and just like what the hell are you doing herman hesse than like most other books of his that I've read. Yes. <laughs> That's it. It's too much. Uh, can we, can I talk about my, my main crackpot theory here, Good which is yeah. that there is no Joseph connect. He's obviously, he's just a symbol, right? He's, he's the servant and that Joseph connects biography is just a glass bead game itself. And then the reference materials for the biography are the three lives at the end. So these are tales, and this sort of fits in to also like in the order they're written by Hesse. But you have these three lives because all glass bead games come from a set of references to start, and then they expand from there. And so he starts from sort of a reference base of master servant, you know, spiritual journey, um, passing things on, reincarnation. But then as he builds out this glass bead game, of Joseph Connect's biography, it becomes this thing that is so much bigger. It becomes a warning against isolationalism. It becomes a warning against splits in society. It becomes a warning against ignoring historical context. So it's just this layer of somebody witnessing or playing or being a part of the glass bead game itself, which is a biography of a totally made up symbol, Joseph Connect, AKA servant. <laughs> It's basically, it's basically the Matrix, or a deeper cut, <laughs> Existence by you know, Cronenberg. Yeah, um, I don't buy so, it. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, do you read the uh, the three the three lives at the end as sort of an appendix to the actual book, which is the Castalia biography? No, it's very much essential. I think it's essential, but I do think it's separate. But the way you just described it is like these are the reference materials for the glass bead game. It's like they're uh, that that sounds like appendix material. That's like it gives you clues to how to interpret the actual story. Yeah, I, I guess I read it kind of inverse. I read the Castalia biography as like a preface. It's like a four hundred page preface 
to what really matters. But what's so weird about like some of the three live stuff, and I mentioned kind of like breaking the fourth wall, and he, he does it all over the place. And so like you have this first story about, um, you know, the Rainmaker, right? But it's written from the future. It's not, it's not in the time of the tribe. And he like, I'll, I'll quote some of this, but he says, uh, this village knew nothing of the luxuries, beauties and refinements, which we today take for granted and which even the poorest among us regard as indispensable. The village had no culture and no arts. It's only buildings were the crooked mud huts. It knew nothing of iron and steel tools. Right. So like it's written from the future. And so that that fits in with the theme of Joseph Connect writing them. But I ask myself is to me that that like starts to blow up these individual stories because it it's like, why would you why would you put a life at the end that's then written from the future? Other than to directly indicate that it's written by Joseph Connect, are you basically just saying that Joseph Connect is actually not that good of a fiction writer? Cause yeah, I don't. I, I don't think, think like those chunks should have been left out. I mean, I don't. I don't think you're sp- supposed to appreciate the lives as great works of fiction, but more as better ways to understand Joseph Connect's progression through life. And in each one, I think you see a better part of him and a greater part of him, and understand his ultimate decision to leave Castilia and to become the mentor to uh little tito jackson whatever tito right <laughs> tito. Um, yeah yeah um let, so let's talk a little bit about joseph connect's death and what how that struck you uh alleged what, death alleged death alleged death. yeah uh <laughs> it, an unreliable narrator wrote this yeah yeah we're, we're assuming that that's how he died i i think when i first read it I was still in the Castilian mind, so I was like, oh, he died because he decided to go and live, and that was his punishment for leaving the intellectual little (laughs) bubble of Castilia. It's like, oh, you want to go experience reality? Okay, your first day, your first insight, and you fucking die. So Yeah, it's like the end of Logan's Run. This is just (laughs) like, it's all science fiction. It's all explained in movies we've already watched. It just doesn't seem like it. But but then I actually I had to read the ending a couple of times because it's so bizarre, and it, it really came out of nowhere for me because I was reading along and thinking, oh, this book's got a lot more to go. We're gonna experience this whole interaction with him and Tito, and then he just he's just gone. He's like, oh, I'm not feeling that great. I'm a little weak. But yeah, what the hell? I'll go jump in this cold lake and swim with this, <laughs> this boy. Yeah. And then he's entirely absorbed by nature. Yes entirely he he lived his whole life separated completely from nature and like this fuck what was i saying yeah so he's absorbed into dust oh yeah dust to you you come to dust you shall return yeah or water but so i don't know what you heard me what what you heard (laughs) what what you heard me say but he lives his whole life separate from nature in this castle of intellectual intellectualism and his first foray into nature up into the mountains he is absorbed completely into the lake. He disappears. He vanishes utterly. Yeah, this is kind of what, where I read it. It is also Hesse fucking with you a little bit. Because isn't it just kind of like a comical end? Yeah, a little bit? it like, was. First, like you have this huge, massive just biography that's so hard to get through. It's just like pulling teeth. And at the end, it picks up a little bit. It get, you know, the writing's a little snappier. Um, the story's better because they admit that it's converted to legend. But this great man just drowns swimming in a lake. I mean, first off, I don't know if they had swimming lessons in Castalia. It's never really addressed. Um, but uh, And even his drowning, I mean, he writes it like he vanished. Yeah. Yeah. He the Tito's swimming. He turns back. His master's there. He swims, turns back, and he's gone. And there's no trace. And that's that's the death. When when I, I was actually listening to the book at this at when this happened and uh when that happened i was like wait what what he just died were there sound effects so a little bit of splashing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then silence yeah i don't know like part part of me think that's like a little bit of just like crass humor again attempted humor on hess's part yeah because it's just black. before he died he, there's a quote he says Everything was new again, mysterious, promising. All that had been could recur, and many new things as well. And then he drowns to death. But I, th- I think comedy and profundity are, you know, two sides of one coin. 
I mean, all drama is comedy. All comedy is drama. Just depends on your lens. So the fact that I can't read comedy. <laughs> very dramatic to me but so actually david that quote that you just read is kind of is kind of interesting because one of my favorite quotes came within one of the lives and so you're talking about right before he dies that he's sort of experiencing more possibilities and he's sort of it's almost like he's getting an echo from from the future of his reincarnation but in in one of the lives in the in the rainmaker story there's this quote of more and more he had to bid farewell to the dream, the feeling and the pleasure of infinite potentialities of a multiplicity of futures. And that's kind of where the Rainmaker is like accepting that this is what his job is. This is what my role is. I, I'm not going to become these other things. I just have this one purpose. And so that quote that you pulled out is basically uh, connect at the end of his servitude. Yes. Uh, right before he perishes, sort of, it almost feels like a like a glimmer from the future of of more potentialities. Yeah, well, your quote keeps going, and I want to finish that because it goes right into this whole idea of the reincarnation and potentiality. It's right where yours end, the, multipl- the multiplicity of futures. It says, <laughs> instead of the dream of unending progress of the sum of all wisdom, his pupil stood by a small, near demanding reality, an intruder and nuisance, but no longer to be rebuffed or evaded. For the boy represented, represented after all, the only way into the real future, the the one most important duty, the one narrow path along which the Rainmaker's life and acts, principles, thoughts, and glimmerings could be saved from death and continued their life in a new small bud. Sighing, gnashing his teeth, and smiling, he accepted the burden. So this, I think, goes back to my theory that this is recurrence so that the lives are actually even though they're written in the past are continuances yeah i mean i I think he's playing with with format like he didn't he doesn't intend you he doesn't intend the narrative strictly speaking to be this is joseph reborn but we as the reader because of the way that it's organized read it as a rebirth and in a way maybe all fiction is a rebirth um and i i think that the fact that he put the poems between the biography and the three lives, I, the poems which express pure ideas absent of forms, um, I can't help but read that as a sort of purgatory of a sort of netherworld, a space between spaces before he's reborn, you know, eons earlier. But so here's a question about reoccurrence, which goes back to which which one came first, was it the lives or the biography or the biography of the lives, but. What's the direction in time of rebirth? See, but, it's kind of all like I think there is no time when it comes to, to rebirth, right? Maybe so. And There's I, I no think, order. Yeah, he's he's playing with this too because obviously the lives in the story, the lives are written before he died. Um, they're also they also take place in the past, but because in the structure of the book they occur last, it it doesn't really matter the lessons that are learned or the lessons that he's illuminating for the reader, I suppose, are learned in this order. Yeah. And in the final life, Dasa basically goes through his own entire life within his own vision. It's like a glass bead game within a glass bead game. Within probably six more glass bead games. (laughs) There's just, there's layers. Like he's, he's doing something and I appreciate it. And I'm like real close to figuring it out. I kind of resent that I like the book so much because he made me suffer. <laughs> well, that's life. Yeah. That's Maya. Yeah. It's one of the noble truths, man. To live is to suffer. I think, And I think he puts you through that. Yeah. I bet he had like a, uh, like a spreadsheet that was like number of interesting things he was going to include in the book and then made sure that the boring shit was like super proportional to what reality was. <laughs> such that the three interesting things that happened in like this 550 pages is about equal to the three interesting things that you do in your life. <laughs> and then you suddenly die from an accident that you didn't plan on and everybody forgets about you. Yeah. There's a lot of pontification, but then, you know, you're dead. So everybody's everybody's just taking a deep breath because this is just like so so trying. Well, I'm looking at like one of the last quotes of the entire book, and it it's really good. Um, I'm not sure what page, but it's one of the last things I had. 
Then there was a brief pause of unconsciousness, or slumber, or death, and immediately afterward, you were awake again, had to admit the currents of life into your heart once more, and once more let the dreadful, lovely, terrible flood of pictures pour into your eyes, endlessly, inescapably, until the next unconsciousness, until the next death. That was perhaps a pause, a moment of rest, a chance to catch your breath. But then it went on, and once again you were one of the thousand figures engaged in the wild, intoxicating, desperate dance of life. Ah, there was no extinction. It went on forever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. It, that's, it. He's talking about sleep there, right? I mean, literally. But it, is, is he not? Like the sweet, sweet arms of eternal slumber? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or do you mean like your nightly eight hours? No, I think he's talking about his nightly eight hours, <laughs> and like, but applying you know, that sleep is like death and that you have to reawaken again and go, the life comes back to you and you have to go through the whole cycle again. Yeah. But, so really, I think, I think clearly he's also saying that, that is that there's a larger, you know, awakening and there's a larger death. Yeah. So Hess is a self-help author saying that each day is a new day. <laughs> I think that's right. the lesson to learn. Yeah. yeah. In between these novels, he just wrote a bunch of fucking memes on the internet. That's right. <laughs> Little picture of a cat. Hang in there, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Herman Hesse. That's right. Uh, so I, I want to go back to you talking about, Nathan, how much you sort of like hate this and love it at the same time. Uh, like, how would you how would you recommend this to someone? Because I struggle with this because I'm like, this book is was fantastic. I love it. But I'm not sure I would like throw anyone into this unless I was dragging them with me. Like, it's a, it's a hard book to pitch. How would you convince like somebody who's at least read like a Hesse or two to be like, you know, like you've you've taken you've taken the Narcissus and Goldman route, but you know, you gotta try this thing. I mean, I think you have to be a little bit of a masochist. And it's like it, you, I think you have to have read some Hesse first. At least that would be ideal. So you kind of think that there's something at the end of the road. <laughs> Even though I didn't think there was anything at the end of the road. I was like, this is this may not ever amount to anything. I just have to plod forward. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I would really recommend it. I can't imagine anyone reading this as their first Hesse book. Yeah, that would be that would be the cruelest joke of them all. <laughs> yeah, because it it really is. I I mean, Nick, you might have to explain why you liked the beginning so much because I found it insufferable so i like the beginning because so it was written as sort of a historical look on current events so we're just dropping books all over the place because we're we're just it's too heavy uh so <laughs> it's basically from the future of castalia uh looking back at current events and so i think if you parse that out that's basically commenting on um all of the stuff that was going on in mid-century Europe. And basically they talk about the age of the Feuilleton and Feuilleton being sort of a lighthearted criticism, sort of variety section of the newspaper. People magazine. People magazine, right. And there's even like, there's some titles of Feuilleton articles that he kind of like makes fun of that is, I think it's like fashion in the age of Nietzsche and then like stuff like that. That sounds like and, uh, academic those... journal writing, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> But I think he was like trying to say that the reason that this absolutism of just like full blown isolationist intellectualism came about is because people were grumbling more and more about like how much fame and how witty and how all these quips that they were trying to inject into scholarship and how it was tainting it. I just want to counter that because he does say that at the beginning, but then later in the biography, um, does he not imply that castalia was established because of the wars yeah i think they established it because so multiple things i think i think scholarship was being tainted i think people understood that they had to preserve some level of of educational superiority from a political standpoint there's a comment in there that like people understood that you needed to have math and science to be able to make the things that we needed for war yeah essentially so i but, think but, that but castalia was established to counter that Castalia, that, that intellect, intellectual intellectualism needs to be 
be about something greater than war and politics. Right. But so Kesalia is a funded like sanctuary, right? Yeah. And so in order to be funded, there had to be some level of relevancy back to the rest of the country that was funding it or nation or whatever the... the... But, see, I, I actually, I read it a bit differently because I see it as like things had been wrecked so badly that somehow sort of like how does the United Nation gets, United Nations gets formed? You know, how do you overcome your political ambitions and say, like, you know, let's make world peace. Right. Well, it was, it was effectively it, like, like what's the actual function of Castalia to the rest of, of the, the country. And it was teachers. Yes. It was the vast majority of people just were trained and then they went back into the, out in the world as teachers. But to provide, to help people think and, um, maintain peace. Correct. To, 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 ground everything in some level of education rather than having basically the entire thing just just blown to bits yeah. through through wars through greed through through all of these things so i think there's actually like a political consciousness in the rest of the world that knows that it needed castalia and that's one of the reasons why sort of castalia is falling apart or is doomed is because it's losing its attachment towards that relevance it's sort of becoming this own animal and that's what the whole circular letters about is them not even being able to see out of their own blinds to understand that like people are forgetting about them. And as soon as they forget about them, then they're not going to exist because they're basically a taxpayer funded organization, sort of like the national endowment for the arts. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Are we are not doing that. No, no we're not doing that. No. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's too relevant. timely. Yeah. Yeah, so back to uh, why I like the beginning so much. I thought that I actually found it to be the part that was most satirical and at times like kind of hard hitting because it basically called out a society that was so obsessed with the fame and sort of the, the uh, just like the shininess of intellect. You know, it talks about people, you know, and their lectures and, and sort of... Uh, urban upper class people who could go to see talks on any of these things TED talks. <laughs> every night. Exactly. It's fucking Ted talks and the articles that he's making fun of. They're like Buzzfeed lists. Like it's all like he just predicted this, that people don't have the space to be able to follow through entire thoughts. So they just need both the assurance that they are doing something intellectual, but they also need it to be fucking shiny. And yeah. so that's what he was making fun of. And like, as I was reading that, I was just like, oh my God, he's totally calling us out. Just like he was likely calling everybody out because it's probably something that has never shifted. And the the answer to that seems to be Castalia, but then he goes on. Well, Castalia then becomes its own closed loop and loses any sort of, of, like a big part of it seems to be about what it might have been set up for was just this idea of giving back to the world of social responsibility in some way. And yet it totally lost it. It lost all connection to responsibility outside of intellectualism for intellectual sake, right? Right. And and that's what the game, I think, is the... That's what it represents. Yeah, it's the epitome of, of intellectual and aesthetic uh, masturbation, really. It's... Because yeah. it, it has no purpose. Which, I mean... W- what is the purpose? What is what is purpose? What defines purpose? Enhancing or adding to or increasing good in some way. Like this game, it's not about. At least from what I can tell, the game itself doesn't seem to be about. There's there's no achievement outside of making intellectual connections to things. At least that's the way it's it's portrayed. Right. It's just about these. And I think he comes down pretty hard on that. Yeah. Like he clearly, I think he has a lot of sympathy for it, the the author. Like that, he admires the glass bead game. Connect admires the glass bead game. He's a he's the preeminent glass bead game player. Yeah. Like that's what he loves more than anything in the world, and yet he ultimately sees that 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 love is not enough. That that's going to contribute to destroying um, itself, basically. Like. He it has to respond to the world at large, and I, I think I think the purpose really, as defined by Hesse in this book, is 
how do you lead how do you lead people towards enlightenment how do you lead people towards the truth yeah you can't lead them by by losing them yeah the, yeah um, you have to engage a great quote, yeah um that there's a great quote that in the rainmaker story where he's trying to figure out how to lead people who are who think that the the world is the sky is falling down um he he says some pretty great things let me see if i can find <laughs> whatever he says it's really great whatever it's really great really guys good. just take my word for it it's super great i'm not gonna read it just believe me <laughs> um he says a seeking thoughtful man dare not forfeit love that he must meet the wishes and follies of men halfway not showing arrogance, but also not truckling to them. That is always only a single step from sage to charlatan, from priest to Montebank, from helpful brother to parasitic drone, and that the people would by far prefer to pay a swindler and be exploited by a quack than accept help given freely and unselfishly. But this idea that even if you're right, even if you know the truth, sometimes knowing the truth isn't what's important. Helping the person next to you take another step forward is what's important. And if that means taking a step towards being a charlatan, to, to abandoning the path of the sage in order that they may take a step forward, that's what purpose is. Hmm. So in the, the, the symbol in the, the Rainmaker story, there's a meteor shower and everybody thinks that the stars are falling and they're going to be engulfed in this great void. And people are like pulling their hair out and cutting themselves. And he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. The stars are in place. This is a layer between heaven and earth that is falling. And we're going to be okay. And nobody can understand him. And nobody can believe him. And then he starts to do this sort of ecstatic dance. And just like throw his body around and gathers everybody around. And everybody starts throwing their bodies around in this, in this group collective dance of madness. And that's what saves, that's what saves the village. Not his understanding what reality is. Yeah, I like, so I like that idea because i think a large chunk of hesse's writing is inherently rebellious in that it's very focused on the individual it's very against the grain and he did that for a long time with a bunch of different avenues a bunch of different concepts and i think this is him sort of looking back on the idea of rebellion and on the idea of individualism and sort of saying that well there's a limit there's needs to be responsible rebellion. There needs to be limited individualism because that itself can be a problem. And so I think, I think the message that I receive the most from the glass bead game is like, it's a cautionary tale. That's my, that's my buzz line. <laughs> um, but it's, it's basically don't isolate yourself so far in some castle of, of intellectualism that you can't identify and you can't pull everyone further along for the greater good. And, you know, and you back that out into what servitude means. And um, honestly, I, I read Joseph Joseph Connect's uh, story as kind of a reason not to ever get into management because you don't end up doing anything you like ever again. And you just get lumped more and more tasks and all of those things. And the reason that you excelled and the reason you got that position, you now just have such responsibility that, uh, you know, now you're stuck just filling out TPS reports. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you no longer honor the truth of the individual and represent something, which is what it's yeah. really about. So I think that's kind of the, I mean, that's the life balance that's tricky, right? Like, do you give so much of yourself away that you completely lose yourself? Or do you, uh, you know, be entirely uh, individualistic and then not have any attachment to anyone else and, you know, run the risk of the dangers that come with that? And I think that's this idea that he's trying to figure out. And all of all of Hess's previous books are pretty much a, a single person against some some idea or some roadblock or, or something that's in the way. And I think this is Hesse putting putting that person back in the context of society. And he could only really write this book with his own experience and his own history in life and his own historical context. And so that's that's what he's really pushing on us. And uh, I don't know, I found it I found it hugely impactful um and like i said i think that's probably why it's my favorite hessa so here's final verdict nathan you already said it is of substance yeah but... and and honestly i'd want to just keep talking about this book okay not final verdict <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think that is my final verdict i mean 
I, I think that that is a strong endorsement is the fact that you want to keep talking about this book and that yeah. there are there's so much we didn't even touch on. I I know it, it would just be it'd be impossible. Yeah, this is and without a doubt a book of substance. It's just it's one that you have to live and die with. I think you're going to go through some deaths. You're going to, yeah. Be, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but if you can keep opening your eyes, keep, you know, keep transcending, go through those stages, what not transcending awakenings. That's what it is. Yeah. That next connect keeps talking about that. He, he lives his life as a series of awakenings. And that's what this book feels like, honestly. So in summary, Hessa is a self-help author. This is the Tony I mean, Robbins of <laughs> European symbolism. Hands down, nobody can be matched. But I, I think, unfortunately, that's the truth of books of substances. <laughs> they help you. If they didn't, then you wouldn't read them. Or at least I wouldn't. Yeah. The reason I read in the first place is just to, I don't know, sort of put in the context to either struggles within myself or within society or, I don't know. Yeah, actually, I, I totally agree. And I think that's what fiction does that self-help books can't honestly fiction is truer than truth fiction is truer than truth but it's also because history's third dimension is fiction so history is truer than truth history <laughs> is the ultimate truth i'm pretty sure nathan just wanted to say ultimate truth a bunch of times in this podcast yeah i think this, i only said it once i think you super, guys said it the rest of the time it's just such it's so it's so so monstrous <laughs> I feel like we're on the cusp of something brilliant when we really have no idea what the fuck we're talking about that's how i feel whenever i read hessa <laughs> but you're approaching ultimate truth yeah every page you're just like i'm one page closer to ultimate truth i'm two pages closer that's just like that's your internal monologue yeah yeah that's cool yeah <laughs> Man, I keep ha falling to like these silences. Too. I feel like there's been a lot of awkward silences in this podcast. Um, kind of like the number of awkward silences in the Glass B game itself as you're reading it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right, what are we doing here? What else you got? I think we give, just need to like meditate. For give us another ultimate. Do you just want some minutes? silence? Yeah, just we like, could do that. We just need some silence. Okay. All right, Glass Bead gamers. Now is the time for meditation.